All right. So despite the July real estate market that we've witnessed firsthand with the uh, inventory soaring through the roof, sales dipping, dropping, crashing, depending on which camp you are and how extreme you want to take it. Despite that, July is about to set a record of all time, historical record for average price. And on this episode of Real Estate Chat with Robert Ede and Jonder Perez. We're going to take you through Robert's analysis of what's to transpire before you see it from the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board. Are you ready for that, Robert? I have to correct you on the one thing there, that uh, based on what I did in the middle of the month, predicting that the past would predict this July and said the prices would only go down 0.5%, only, it becomes the highest July average price in history. So we'll see what happens on Tuesday when the report comes out. All right. So time will tell. Let's jump into it first yeah. of all. With uh, Let's look at the inventory because this is one of the stories that's been proliferating and the reason why it's very puzzling why buyers aren't coming into the market, but even more puzzling why prices the way they are. Let's start with the story of inventory, Robert. Well, this is months of inventory, which rather than a sales to listing ratio is the um, benchmark that I have chosen to use because at the last day of the month, you get a number that are the number of properties that are active. In this case, we've got 24,000 and change. And you get a total for the month of the number of sales, which this time was 53.89, a little disappointing. You divide one into the other and you get the months of inventory on the market. And that cannot be fudged with, with relists or terminates or anything. It just cannot be fudged with. So that's what this indicates here. And it says, based on those two pieces of information, you got four, nearly and a half months of inventory. Now we've had four and a half months inventory before, but it was never a happy time. Uh, in between the great financial collapse, crisis, whatever you want to call it, global, um, which if you follow that red line right across and you know, yeah, in the middle of that red line, uh, the only time we went over that was uh, in the terrible time of 08 and part of 09. So we are up to four. We nearly got up to four uh, last year, but we were we were dancing around wondering if three was bad. So um, buyers, the reason for this is both, as you said at the outset, the number of listings is up. We'll look at inventory and the number of sales is down to, you know, 30 percent off normal. And so the resulting is um, everybody waiting for either lower rates or lower prices or both, a buyers anyway, and sellers saying, what do I have to do to sell my house? Should I be patient or do I need a price reduction? Which is one of our famous uh, slogans that you can get on a t-shirt, patience or a price reduction. Uh, so there we are on the first one, four and a half months of inventory. It's a benchmark to compare to previous times and future times. And for those of you who have uh, not liked or subscribed yet, uh, make sure you do click like and subscribe and watch our previous episode where we talked about the buyer's revenge, uh, because that's pretty much what's uh, a quick way to describe it. Like, but Robert, what is the actual, uh, in, in your words here, what is the actual root problem? Like what's causing all of this to happen right now? Okay. Well, the obvious and what the top half of the chart is about is the difference in the interest rates. I picked an arbitrary $1 million house with 20% down, leaving an $800,000 mortgage at 2%. The factor is for 23 per 1,000 per month. And comparing it with 5%, which I think if you search now, you can and you're good, you can get a 5% uh, first mortgage. So the payments are based on 582 per thousand. Now, the tricky part is that in order to get a 5% mortgage approved, you've got to qualify at 5% plus 2%, which is 7%. And that works out to $7 uh, dollars per thousand per month. So instead of needing $157,000 to qualify in the initial one at 2%. And then at 5%, it's 208,000. When we go way over to the bottom corner with the qualifying added 2%, it's $100,000 a year, 246 versus 157 uh, to qualify. So what is the root problem? Why the stagnation? Why are 
buyers looking for lower prices or lower rates or both? And why are sellers saying, why is it so hard to get what I could get very easily uh, a year ago or six months ago for my house? And so we've got down in the fine print there, what is the market suffering from or because of what? The increase in interest rates and resulting increase in payments and qualifying income, is that the problem, the increase in interest rates? The absence of non-occupant spec buyers they are not participating in the market right now. Now, on, on that, those people gobbled up inventory and pushed up the prices because they always buy at the bottom of the market, which is first-time buyer territory. So they're gone. It's number C, three, the sidelining of first-time buyers awaiting a drop in prices or interest rates. Is that what we're suffering from? Uh, that is a factor. But we said the other thing was uh, so many additional properties on the market from normal. And or is it is it the clampdown on issuance of multiple first mortgage commitments to condo buyers using the same income documents again and again? This is a scam that or a, a strategy that was being employed by non owner occupant people uh, with the pre construction market that they would buy up six of them, and that's great. Uh, they would have to have the capital, they have to have the money. Maybe they could borrow it against their, their home uh, equity line of credit. And then they would just use this thing. Here's my income and here's what I have and here's my assets. And they would get approved. And then they would use the same document to go to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. They approve five times on the same thing. So no scrutiny there. Now that made the spec buying of, you know, there was pre-construction in new builds too. A buddy of mine moved to Lindsay. He was there the day after COVID quit and bought builder that had been going there for two years, he couldn't sell them. So he got all kinds of, you know, concessions and built-ins and stuff like that because he was there first to buy this 60-foot lot bungalow. But then Lindsay went absolutely crazy. He says, now these moved in there a year and a half ago that most of the houses on his street are uh, rented, are not owner-occupied, and some of them have uh, like 10 cars in the driveway. There's students in there. Uh, it's being used in a number of different ways other than single family residential. So what is the real estate market suffering from? All of them. Yes, all of them. And we can't say it out loud. The prices are too high, but the prices are too high. And what are we going to do about it? We have to wait for the, 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 the confidence and for the consumer income to go up and for interest rates to come down. Prices may moderate a little bit more, but what we're seeing right now is um, buyers not wanting to buy because they hope there's a better future. Until the, till the bottom is shown to them, they'll continue to do that. And it's just a matter of hanging tight there, right? Because, I mean, we're now, as we're recording this, it's literally the second, the second day of August. As fall market is right around the corner, so... Would it be fair to say, Robert, that what transpires over the next two to three weeks will set the tone for what the fall market should look like? No, no, because August is never a peppy month. If we if we look at the sales that uh, were coming up a year ago, 5,200. So we just saw that same amount uh, this month in July and said it was lousy. So it's going to be the summer doldrums. It's just what it is that right. the school year and the weather are what dictate what happened. When the kids go back to school, now people will start saying, okay, we couldn't do it last year. I wonder if we can do it now. Can we buy something before the snow flies? So there's always a fall rally. It's not as big as the spring fling, but August is gonna be a good time to take vacation. Okay, so it's gonna be a couple more weeks of what we've been seeing now. Sad so but true, sad but true. Be worried about and then September fall market. Things should pick up. Uh, so let's look at this uh, illustration here, because uh, you you included this as well, just to show uh, the effects of uh, mortgages in terms of uh, what the payments will be. And um, uh, Right. So the, the whole significance of this, this is duplicated. Once on a million dollar house, and then exactly the same thing on the next slide goes for $650,000 house. Comparing the payment for principal and interest and estimated uh, taxes at... Uh, First, two percent, and then second, uh, five percent, and comparing the difference, qualifying at uh, five percent is thirty-seven point five nine percent more expensive, and qualifying at the stress test 
is 65.58% more expensive. If we go to the next slide, we'll see it's exactly the same percentage, it's exactly the same ratios, 37 change, 65 and change. So those are the constant realities we looked at in the previous chart of it's the rates are higher, costs more to borrow, and then you add the qualifying to it, it makes it even more, even closer to impossible for regular people to buy their first house, never mind the million dollar um, uh, price tag. So the question becomes then, is this one of the reasons contributing to the ever inflating amount of homes for sale is the fact that first timers uh, who need to get into these homes aren't qualifying because of this arbitrary stress test? Well, they're being eliminated at the pre-qualifying, which we always say to the first guy and first time buyer coming in have you been to the bank have you been to your favorite institution have you been pre-qualified do you know exactly what you can um can borrow because we don't want to be disappointed in this 10-day period where people uh, are conditional on getting their financing approved we find out what they can do then so very few people are surprised in the in the in the qualifying uh, in a deal uh, conditional time period but they are surprised when they figure out the numbers and say, well, we really can't move from here. We better stay here and save more money or we better start looking further afield. I wonder what's happening in Guelph. I wonder what's happening in Bowmanville um, just to get the price down a little bit. So this is the impact of the interest rates and the stress test as adding like 40%, nearly 70% with the stress test. Uh, and that's standing in the way of regular people now. 2% is never coming back. So maybe we shouldn't compare it to 2%, but only by 2% did we get up to 1.33%, $1.33 million as the average price, only fueled by that low, low rate. Now, speaking about prices, this is where we talked about in our intro that uh, despite the prices dipping on, I guess, a month-to-month -month basis, when you're looking at the year-over-year -year prices, we're going to we're going to be a, we're going to see an historical, an historical July. Robert, take us through this. Okay, we'll skip to the next slide just to give us the background. This is what I use. I say what happened in the last 23 years. And in the last 23 years, the difference between June and July was a minus 3.69% on average. One year was up and 22 were down. So I said, okay, I don't think it's going to go down 3.69% which is the average to go down. I, I, what I sense, I don't see people throwing low offers and being successful. I don't see properties selling for a lot off the asking price. They're still doing a lot of this. I'm asking less than I expect, but I'm expecting to get more for that on a future date. So I use this to say, okay, June will vary. July will vary from June by 0.5%, half a percent. And based on that, I got one point. Uh, $1,156,356. We plug that back into our year over year over year over year chart. And lo and behold, it's a little bit lower, 0.5% from the month before of June. But it's, if that holds out to be true, the highest July ever. And it's up 3.4% from the year before. Now, we can't remember last July too well because there's so many things that's happened in the meantime. But we had a doldrums for most of the, you know, second, third, fourth quarter of last year. And the year before that, we had a doldrums. You can see them depicted here. But uh, price has not been the issue yet. Nobody has been giving away property. No one has capitulated in a negotiation. It's still um, as good as it's ever been. Our sellers remaining so confident despite everything that's going on. And 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 what's what's really puzzling is there's, there's a lot of choice and there's a lot of selection. So, I mean, here's where information is a bit, like, I don't know if skewed is the right word or if there's a certain bias of looking at things. There are homes that are listed that don't ever sell or they don't sell at the first attempt, second attempt, third attempt, and so forth. When we're looking at prices, it only takes into account what actually does trade. So when a seller and buyer meets, so like it is, okay, is it you're, just, you're absolutely right. And this is where averages are uh, hard to follow and difficult to get true indications of, because this is a composite of, as we've said many a time, the five different market components of the resale real estate market. You've got first time buyers. They're not in, they're not playing. You got 
uh, buy sell customers or you've got last time sellers who are selling and uh, they've got nothing else to buy. You've got buy sell customers that are trading. You've got investors who are underwater that that's why there's so many investment and, uh, you know, properties with tenants in them for sale and investors who are in there for the long term. Maybe they bought it five years ago. And so if they sold it today, they would be uh, in the money. So the only people who have their property for sale now are people who have already bought and people who are underwater with their investment. So the underwater ones, if we make a generalization, are only willing to sell if they can get 90%, 95% of what they put in, plus all their expenses, plus all the interest and return on the investment. They're, they're not willing to give it away. They'll say, I'll rent it again. I don't really want to rent it again, but I will rent it again and carry it monthly rather than take a huge bath because they had to put, you know, a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars cash down. So if they take a 10% bath, that's all coming out of their uh cash uh investment. So time and money. So why is it that it seems like there's nothing any good for sale if you're a buyer? Because only the best properties that come on the market and they're selling in five days. The rest of them, if there's been 13 days, it's been 37 days, it's been 139 days, there's something wrong with that property. It either backs onto the 401, it's in terrible condition, it's a tenant that won't let you in. So I think we said this before, many, 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 half of the properties that are for sale are wasting their time. The agent should say, look, Let's take it off the market until there's a more favorable balance of buyers and sellers. And this fellow says, look, it doesn't cost me anything. You're the one doing the work on it. You're investing the time in it. So we steady as we go. It's up for sale stuff. Well, another interesting thing to point out when it comes to pricing strategies is the, I mean, this could be an episode in itself, but something I saw recently, uh, everybody's been familiar with the underprice, hold back offers, wait for offer night. Uh, everybody knows what listing at market looks like. Everybody knows what a mix of that looks like. So uh, some of the listings are priced under, holding offers next week. Some are at market offers anytime. But there's a third one coming around, which is underpriced with offers anytime. And then you're sort of unclear as to the expectation. Are they expecting over ask, but they don't want to set an offer date? Or are they literally just selling it at market? And I've encountered a couple of those uh, from our hallmarkers who have share this information with you. What, what's your insight into that, Robert? Well, uh, real estate salesmen only have three ideas. The first one they use right off the bat and they use it every time. If that doesn't work, they use their second idea. If that doesn't work, they use their third idea. If that doesn't work, they'll do anything. And they have to stand there in front of the owner and say, everything that I know has not, and it's worked successfully over the last five or 10 years since I've got my license, isn't working. Uh, we could try this. I heard this about this at the, at, you know, scuttled out at the office water cooler. And he says, okay, we'll try that. But you're right. There's all kinds of different strategies so that if you, you don't know that market, particularly if you just wandered into Simcoe County for the very first time, you don't know what's good, what's bad. Um, the greatest percentage of low list offer date are failing. They're coming through again and coming through at, you know, 10% higher. Uh, the one you're talking about where they're underlisting it below their expectation and not having an offer date, I don't know what they're expecting. They will get traffic. Like it's the real estate salesperson's job to get traffic. And it's the owner's job to decide whether the offer is good enough. If right now you're not getting any traffic, you got to do something to get traffic. Then you start working on offers. Then you start working on price. So is that an explanation? It's a guess. All right. Moving on, well, we saw this one already. So let's look at uh, what sales is going to be looking like. Okay, uh, our prices, uh, our, our sales rather, are sort of disappointed. They were up over six thousand, and we're doing better than July. Now they've fallen back back to where they were, uh, making last year the twenty fourth best when it was the twenty third best, and we've taken its place as the twenty third best, and we're, you know, twenty. I'm sorry, thirty one to. 35% off the traditional averages. So it's a slow month. There is not no sales, but it's summer and it's 35% off what might be considered normal going back 20 years. I mean, but at the same time, as you said, it is summer. So even though the cycle, even though they are low sales, 
when you're looking at the patterns on a year to year basis, there was there is no surprise really that that July well, is look the just over look at that triangle going down. There's the worst of COVID. Everything was locked down. April of that year, we saw uh, nearly three thousand sales. The next month, we saw forty six hundred sales, and then we came right back to the most roaring crazy time we've ever seen, and uh, like eleven months consecutively of uh, all time records when we had the dirt cheap interest rates. So. That's how you get an average. You have the dirt cheap, or you have the very low and the extremely high. Uh, so uh, it's there's nothing wrong with the real estate market right now, except caution is buyers are over cautious and you can't even show them a good deal because they say, I want something better. Perfect. Let's look at the inventory story because uh, I mean, inventory is just shot through the roof. Like we're at 24,000. It seems to be hovering at that. When will this inventory go down? Well, we're well, that's a spike, okay? And I have another chart that says we look for the spikes. If you go back far enough, you see spikes going up to 18 months. So uh, we hope that uh, that goes down. Um, right now, we're 64% above the five-year average, 51% above the 10-year average, and 36% above the 16-year uh, average. So it could come down to... 18 and that would be fine and it's but a mix i mean it? It, and it's a factor of how many of them sell versus how many of them are sellers who just say you know what forget it i'm not gonna i'm not even gonna participate in this market anymore so well, it would take been a tremendous turn tremendous number of suspensions and terminates in the course of the last two months just people saying take it off the market if you know sell in may and go away or if you haven't sold in june take it off the market because there's no point in getting the house dressed up every morning at seven o'clock and keeping it all spick and span and then nobody showing up five days in a row yeah, so, i mean some of these some of these sellers may have missed for example the spring market or didn't get what they wanted in the spring despite that fact that it was a pretty decent market and you know just just push it through fall um now here's one that we did review in our previous uh, episodes as well and uh, I'm making it akin to the 86 96 uh situation robert where do you see us uh, ending up after july well, we're still within these we got these two lines we're going along the tops and going along the bottoms that are seem to be trending and there's absolutely no reason to use this which they use in technical analysis of the stock market trades on real estate there's absolutely no reason to do it it may have nothing to do with anything but it does seem to indicate that we're following the trend that was established the peak was in 89 and it didn't quit until 96. It could be, it could be uh, the future. Takeaways from this episode for our Real Seat Chat viewers. I mean, it is summer. If your home is listed, you know what's going on with it. If you're buying, you know what your sentiment about is buying. But for those Real Seat Chat viewers who are looking for a fall strategy, anticipating what's to come in September, October, November, Robert, uh, buyer sellers, what should we tell our viewers to do? We know that in a, in a year, interest rates will be down by 1%. And so all you have to do is buy something at a low market, a buyer's market price, and figure out a way to finance it for a year so that when a year time comes, you can refinance it at a lower rate of interest. And maybe you can do it again after that. It'll just depend. But the key ingredient is acquiring the asset in the place that you want at the price that you want and worry about the finance secondary. Uh, I, I think people do want to get what they want. And if you have to do it in two steps, well, so be it. There's a great selection. So look for the, someone who wants to sell it really bad. They've been there for 35 years. They've done everything. They've got underground sprinklers. It's a fabulous, wonderful place and you'll love it. So, Negotiate with them. Maybe they'll give you a second mortgage at 2%, 0% even. Just get over the hurdle of the first year. Sellers, anybody who has listed on the market right now and are not getting the price that they want on the offers, are they better off waiting? Like, are they better off keeping the listing on and, and entertaining offers? Or should they just list in the fall and expect a higher price? Well, it's patience or a price reduction. The The other thing is put your house on a schedule. Showings are going to be on this, this, this day between this, this, this hour. And you got to tell me a day ahead. It's one of the things on the uh, broker bay is that you tell me a day ahead. Then you know how to plan your life. 
You don't get up early to clean the house and scrub out the bathroom and have nobody show up. Just take it half off the market so it's available. If you suspend it, there's no showing. Just nobody, it doesn't even show up. But put it on a schedule. And so that you know you got to be prepared on Saturday afternoon. But by Friday night, you'll know whether you got Saturday free. If people right. aren't coming, don't kill yourself. But at the same time, stay active. Interesting strategy, half off the market, half on the market. And on that note, thank you for watching this episode of Real Estate Chat. If you have any questions about how to navigate the remaining summer weeks of this market or going into the fall market, feel free to type it into the comments or reach out uh, to Robert and myself. Stay tuned for future episodes. We've got more exciting topics to chat about. Take care. Bye for now. See you later.